Um, now we will be talking about building scalable IoT systems with MQTT and with AWS. So before we, before we get started, um, just a very brief introduction. My name is Dominic Obermeier. I'm CTO and one of the founders of HiveMQ. Um, we also have a booth here in the data zone, which we will see later. So for anybody who finds it interesting, please feel free to stop by and have some conversations about IoT systems. Um, also, you can follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn in case you find it interesting and you want to exchange thoughts about large-scale systems. So, MQTT is to the Internet of Things what HTTP is to the web. And for the people who haven't heard of MQTT before, um, before we talk about the technology, let's talk about where MQTT is used today. And here's just a small section of our customers that use MQTT. And there's really everything from um, big household names in the US, from um, big connected car platforms like Autonomic, which is connecting all of the cars worldwide for Ford, um, to car companies like Mercedes-Benz, telecommunication companies, and so on. And MQTT as a technology is being used um, especially in connected products, in smart manufacturing, fleet management, logistics, asset tracking, industrial IoT, and so on. And in this session, we will talk about some of the architecture patterns and also how you can build scalable systems based on MQTT on AWS. So let's talk a bit about technology. So MQTT is a communication protocol that is built with uh, the publish subscribe pattern. Um, this means there's a broker the architecture, and this broker the architecture makes sure that publishers of data, which could be anything like cars, um, could be factories, or could be other things, push data to a centralized systems, and you can have a virtually unlimited amount of consumers of the data, and you can scale up and scale down however you, you feel fit and what you need. MQTT is reliable and bidirectional. This means you can connect devices over standard internet, requires TCP IP, and it has, similar to your smartphones, an open TCP connection all the time, which allows for push communication down to a device. And what's really great about it, it's super efficient, it's super small, and as a fun fact, it was originally built for monitoring oil pipelines and um, where you really want to save every bit and byte. And the characteristics of the MQT protocol makes it possible that it scales really, really, really big. And with really big, what I mean with that is, so we have customers in the connected car space that connect uh, 30 million devices to a single installation on the AWS cloud. And we're talking about 10 EC2 instances um, for connecting all of these millions of devices, like 30 million plus. Now let's look at some patterns, how you can make use with MQTT on AWS. So a very, very basic connected car use case. So um, connected cars these days uh, all have, an, have TCP IP support, and most of the connected cars worldwide are actually using MQTT to connect to clouds like AWS. And the typical pattern is that you have a so-called MQTT broker, in our case HiveMQ, directly running on either EKS, Kubernetes, um, or EC2 instances directly. And then you can directly integrate with all of these services that are um, uh, evaluated like event streamings. You can have uh, Kinesis. Um, very often you see Apache Kafka these days where uh, MSK really shines also. Also DynamoDB, but also backend applications usually directly communicate with the MQTT broker. And it's, it's actually as simple as that. 
So what you do in order to scale up, you add more and more EC2 instances or use your Kubernetes cluster to auto-scale your deployment up. The second pattern I want to talk about is industrial Internet of Things. So um, what is really special about IIoT is that you usually have a cloud component, but you also have multiple factories. And if you ever were in a factory, um, you would have seen that you really, really, under no circumstance, want your internet connectivity to be in the critical path for making sure you're still producing. Because you're losing tens of thousands of dollars every minute you have a downtime. So this means that usually you have a pretty autarkous deployment on the edge, and then you're using the cloud uh, for connecting all of the data. And the key is to have um, a resilient communication, but you also want to make sure that if the cloud connectivity is not there, that uh, you have zero downtime. Or actually, you're not losing data and you're not um, yeah, losing any, any goods you produce. And so, usually you, you work with a gateway that is connecting the physical assets, likely over protocols like OPC, OA, Modbus, and others. Um, but also modern PLCs, like if you go to Alan Bradley, if you go to Siemens, if you go to Opto22 or others, they have native MQTT support these days. So you can natively connect PLCs directly to MQTT infrastructure. And how it works is you're connected to a local broker, and this local broker bridges messages into the cloud and brings it to the services you want to uh, work with the data, consume the data, and process the data. So why, why would you integrate MQTT with AWS services? So mainly you're analyzing data for insights, so because you need to do something with the data, obviously. Um, you need to store the data, make it accessible, and also AWS has superior services for processing data at scale. But the integration can be difficult sometimes. So you really want to make sure, under every circumstance, that you have a consistent mapping of AWS services with MQTT data, and you want to make sure that under no circumstance you're losing the, uh, data. And we talk about in a second how you do that. And also you want to make sure that you have a unidirectional, but also bidirectional data movement. This means you can send data to the cloud and back from the cloud. Um, to either you connect a car, to your factory, or to your connected product. And another benefit, of course, is you really need to scale. This is where the cloud really shines. But you also want to make sure you have pieces of software that don't only scale in the cloud, but you can also scale on the edge. So in our case, um, our customers use the HiveMQ MQTT platform, which has native integrations to many AWS services out of the box, but also has um, connections to services outside also of the, the uh, AWS ecosystem. So what we see a lot is that many customers are using our data lake extensions to push data natively, for example, into S3 buckets. They use Apache Kafka or Kinesis. They use Lambdas for stream processing. Um, and they also use uh, uh, services like CloudWatch, X-Ray, and Cognito for uh, either managing authentication, authorization, and also making sure you have an observable system out of the box um, at, in the AWS. So the, the patterns which you usually see and have brought three patterns is um, what we call real-time message processing. What this means, you have MQTT endpoints, similar to what we've seen with connected cars or factories, connected products which connect to an HiveMQ MQTT broker cluster. And what turns out to be very useful in the AWS ecosystem 
is if you can directly integrate to Kinesis. Um, and Kinesis is like super low latency, and also the throughput is really, really high. So you can process tens of thousands of messages or even more um, with Kinesis, run lambdas, or pump it into uh, Kafka with uh, MSK, or use backend applications directly. And depending on the latency requirements and the, the kind of service or microservices you're building, you can also have a bi-directional way back from the applications over MQTT directly to the broker or integrate natively with Kinesis. And um, an example is, and we also have a case study at our booth for people who are interested, is um, we have a car manufacturer in Germany, BMW, who's using um, real-time message processing techniques in order to make sure that a car is locked and unlocked in seconds, or actually milliseconds, um, from edge to cloud. And um, this pattern allowed them to go from a user experience that was not so good many years back to a user experience that is now really good and really snappy. Because these days, as everybody knows, customers expect real-time connectivity and they expect real-time latency. So nobody's able, nobody wants to wait standing in front of your car in order to lock or unlock a car or do anything with it. Another pattern I want to talk about is uh, durable storage patterns. So very often, you don't need the data real time. You don't need to process it with stream processing techniques. Very often, if you have a telemetry use case, you have MQTT devices, and then you want to send data to the cloud in order to store it and to process it. And there's multiple ways how to do it. For lower scale applications, this means we're talking about hundreds of messages per second you want to store. Um, services like RDS for relational databases um, are really good and are really cost efficient. Also services like Aurora, um, but there is also, if you have unstructured data, DocumentDB with MongoDB compatibility is something that's also very useful. Um, or also what we see a lot these days is customers moving the data to a data lake, um, structuring it usually with Parquet or with other uh, file formats, and they're making it accessible for other services like AWS Glue um, and do something with the data um, more downstream. And very often you also want to combine that. So you very often have a live data, but there's also uh, the durable data you want to have. And this is where also services like Amazon Time Streams, Time Stream is really useful. So using Kinesis as the main entry point into the AWS ecosystem, and then using it as a bi-directional data stream for HiveMQ and the MQT devices to send data into databases um, into S3, um, transform data, um, and then also use the analytic services uh, that are available, um, and also the machine learning uh, services and also AI services, which we've seen a lot uh, um, being launched in this event. And really my last point I want to, to bring here for this presentation is you really want to make sure that the data you collect from IoT devices is really good and is really sound. And data quality tends to be one of the big problems the more data you have and the more you collect. And we saw it very often with customers that they were sending unstructured data into a data lake and then process it there. The problem is it's not very cost efficient. So it's much better if you actually change the data, validate the data, and also um, yeah, modify the data once you identify your sped data. And with the HiveMQ platform, there's a functionality we call Data Hub that allows to run policies, schema validation, um, and also transformation, and allow you, even if you have producers of bad data, to identify that, and then also to either redirect the data, heal the data, drop the data, and then also get visibility how the data quality is. 
Um, and this is especially useful if you have more and more either customers or departments that are saying data in formats you don't know. And you want to make sure that they all fulfill some specific contracts. And this is also available today together with AWS services. And it's also especially useful for services like Lambda um, and, and others. And now, uh, thank you for watching this presentation.